Well, the temperatures are getting a little cooler and the leaves are getting a little more colorful and it's that time of year where people will drive from all over the country if they're allowed in our state to see the, the beautiful leaves. Uh, I'm so glad you're here today and I'm really thrilled for those of you who are online joining us today. In fact, what I'd like us to do in the room is uh, there's a live stream team that work very diligently to make sure that what we see here is able to be seen other places too. Can we just thank our live stream team for all the work that they do? Yeah. And we're thrilled that you're part of this day with us and uh, we just want you to enjoy being with us, even if you can't be exactly in the same room, we, just like uh, we heard from Stephen, we can be of one mind, we can be of one spirit, we can live together in unity, and that's an important thing. So good morning to everyone. We're continuing our series. Oh, just before I get to that, uh, uh, October is a month known as Pastor Appreciation Month, and uh, a lot of people might not even be aware of the pastoral team that we have at Calvary Assembly. What I can tell you is, is that when COVID hit, it hit everyone, um, lots of people wound up working from home, lots of people wound up not being able to send children to school, lots of people wound up not being able to work for a while. And uh, the church was not exempt from that. Like they, they closed us down too. And uh, so during that time, what I can tell you is we all had to learn to do different things and we had to do the things we could do differently. And I cannot speak highly enough of the incredible effort of our pastoral team to work diligently to make sure that the good news keeps going out even if we can't open doors. And so I'm so grateful for that. Um, their names and addresses are on the screen and if our uh, email addresses, if, if you'd like to shoot them a little thank you note or just a note of encouragement uh, during this month, I know it would mean a great deal to them. We're in a series called Being the Church because going to church is not enough. We're called to be the church. Um, I don't know how tech savvy you consider yourself to be. There are some people who are so cutting edge, you need a Band-Aid when you get around them. And then there are other people who wear their lack of tech savviness like a badge of honor. I don't even own one of those smart devices, they'll say. And, uh, but computers, uh, the, the, te the, the phrase I tend to use is technology is wonderful when it works. Yeah. And, uh, and it really can be. It's also true uh, this, that computers are limited to what they can do based on their capacity and their programming. A computer can't just do whatever it wants. In fact, there's a whole genre of science fiction devoted to the idea that computers develop a will of their own and go up against humans. And usually it doesn't go so well for the humans. Um, there are some people who when they think about humans, they consider them little more than biological computers. That we have capacity and we have programming and we just live that out. Some people think about this in terms of psychology or sociology. So your family of origin obviously would have a huge influence and some people think that's just going to pretty much determine your life. Uh, other people, actually, from a theological point of view, consider God to be the one who programmed you for all the things that appear to be decisions to you. And their definition of God being in control of all things is that he can controls everything, including the decisions of your life. So the question, it's a good question to ask, have we been programmed by God? And if so, what options do we really have? Or are we just living that out? And uh, this passage in Acts, I think, really helps us uh, approach this with an interesting perspective. So we're in Acts. We're going to begin in the first few verses. We're skipping a section, going down to the end of the chapter. And then I'm going to come back next week to, to hit the uh, section that we're skipping this morning. That uh, I've been taking about a chapter a week in Acts, and there are two stories in the book of Acts chapter 8 that uh, it's just, it's, we, we can't leave one of them out. So this is the first one. It says, on, the, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. 
Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Let me say that again. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. And Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. I'm going to go down to verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kendake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. It's out of Isaiah chapter 53. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. As a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And then Philip began with the very passage of scripture that told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot and then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up, Out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again. And he went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared in Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Uh, Last week we talked about how Stephen had been martyred, and uh, it unleashed... um, an unrestrained form of persecution against the church. This wasn't just looking down on people or nuanced comments uh, that often are used about people of faith. It was an all-out effort to exterminate them from the world. And uh, what's interesting is that what was intended as church extinction wound up becoming church planting that the, the believers were scattered everywhere from Jerusalem and yet everywhere they went, it says they preached the word. So here's one point I'd like you to take away this morning, and that is even when you are not in control, you still have options. Even when you are not in control, you still have options. They couldn't stay in Jerusalem any longer, and they were fleeing because of persecution but they still proclaimed the good news everywhere that they went. See, you may not have a voice in in where you are going or even where you are right now, but you can find your voice where you are right now. You may not be able to determine your geographic location, but you can determine how you interact with people in that location. And this is what was really interesting is that other people benefited when those believers showed up. It it gave examples that says that there were spiritually oppressed people who found freedom and there were people who were paralyzed that began to be able to walk as a result of these believers going into other regions of the world. And it said this, there was joy in that city. Here's another point I'd like to, to bring home to you today and for you to think about. When the church is the church, there is joy in the city. When the church is the church, there is joy in the city. 
I don't know what kind of religious environment you grew up in. Maybe you didn't have any upbringing in religious environment, and maybe you grew up in very liturgical or less liturgical uh, environments. But in the environment that I grew up in, it was very common for people to expect the pastor to say things that was highly offensive and really uh, uh, stirred up guilt within them and made them feel horrible about the person that they, that they were. And, 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 and they would come up after a service where a message like that was preached and they would say to the preacher, you really stepped on my toes today. That was a great message. Okay. And there are some people, I'm, I'm not trying to speak in a negative way, but there are some people who honestly believe that the role of the church is to make the world feel bad about what it has become. I happen to think the world doesn't need any help with that. I think they feel plenty bad enough. And Jesus didn't come and tell us to share news that makes people feel even worse he tells us to share good news. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does to me. So when the church is the church, there's joy in the city. So now we get a, an example of this. Philip was instrumental in this spiritual awakening that was taking place in Samaria. And while he's doing that, an angel appears to him and tells him to go to a specific road heading in a direction south and into the desert. So uh, you don't have to answer the question, but just think about it. If an angel showed up and said, I want you to go to a road, I'm not going to tell you what's going to happen when you get there, but I'd just like you to go and kind of walk on that road, would you do it? The angel didn't say what was going to happen, but we know from reading the story that artificial human barriers are about to be shattered. It's astonishing what's going to happen. So Philip is walking down a road. I don't know how long, but as he's walking, there's, there comes a chariot driving by, and, and, and in the chariot, there's a very exotic person. You have to realize, if you grew up in the ancient world in the Middle East, you didn't get exposed to all that much cultural diversity. And so here's a person who is black, he's wealthy, he's a high-ranking official, and he's, he's traveling in a chariot, which was a very extravagant way to travel back then, and he's reading a scroll of Isaiah. So the chariot and the scroll tell you this guy has money. You, you wouldn't have either one of those things without that. And he's a high-ranking official. And he's coming from Jerusalem where it said that he wanted to worship. And this is what we know. If he went to Jerusalem to worship, he was refused access to worship. By reason of his cultural background and by reason of the fact that he was a eunuch. And if, if you don't know what a eunuch is, it means a person who's been castrated. You might, well, why would a person do that? Well, in the ancient world, that was happened usually one for two reasons. In the ancient world, it could have been a form of punishment. But it could also be that if you were going to work around a royal family, they didn't want you having any children with any royal family. And so the deal was you get to work here, but you can never be able to have children your entire life. And there were people who were willing to make that decision. And I know you're sitting here going, oh, boy, the world has changed a lot. Not so much. I think there are lots of people who choose career over family all the time. We just don't do it in a surgical way. And so in Deuteronomy 23, it says, just by reason of that procedure alone, he would not be permitted access to worship. So imagine the emotions of an individual who's trying to process, he has a desire to know the God of Israel. He's fallen in love with the words of his prophets. He's traveled a long way. And he's hoping that he can participate. And he's sent home. Uh, in the ancient world, when you would read, you would read aloud. And that's how uh, Philip knows what passage he's reading. So this guy's riding his chariot. And, and, and the spirit prompted Philip to go near and stay near the chariot. So now the chariot is going, and, and Philip is kind of jogging beside it. And he hears the guy talking about this, reading this passage from Isaiah, and he said, do you, do you understand what you're reading? I love the fact that he opened the conversation with the question. 
And in fact, the Ethiopian is going to ask three questions himself before the story is done. The first is, is how can I understand unless someone guides me? Second question is, who's the prophet talking about? Is he talking about himself or someone else? See, this is what's interesting, is that after the resurrection of Jesus, it tells us that Jesus prioritized spending time with his closest followers, explaining in all of Scripture who he was. Everything that Scripture had to say about him. Isaiah 53 would have been a significant passage. So he's been trained in that by, by the apostles. And this is where we discover a really important truth, is that as Christianity crosses barriers. Christianity crosses barriers. I know, I know, there are lots of people who would like to say that Christianity is actually responsible for a lot of the barriers in the world today, but the people who say that actually don't pay attention to any of the actual information, either in Scripture or in the world in which we live. Christianity is not just for white people. It's not just for wealthy people. It's not just for educated people. In the Americas, which includes the United States, Canada, Mexico, um, uh, all of the Americas, South America, 37%, 37% of all the Christians in the world live in the Americas. 26% live in Europe. That's, that's United Kingdom, Germany, Poland, Russia, Italy, Spain, Greece. 24% in Sub-Saharan Africa. That's Ethiopia, Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya. 26% in Asia Pacific, that's China, India, Philippines, Australia, Korea. 4% in the Middle East and North Africa, that's Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Iraq. By the way, there is a revival going on right now, a spiritual awakening in that part of the world that they, we can't tell the stories of. It's unbelievable what God is doing in that region of the world. You see, Christianity is not tied to one country. It's not tied to one ethnicity. If you look at the major religions of the world, they never move past the place that they were originally founded. All the religions of the world where they were founded, it's still its center, and it's still that, that ethnic population makes it most, but it's not so with Christianity. Christianity has gone to every tribe, every kindred, every tongue, every geographical location, every ethnicity, every income bracket, every education bracket. Why? Because Jesus was insistent the good news is for everyone. Everyone. All the time. No exceptions. So more than any religion in the world, Christianity crosses boundaries and barriers. The reason, the reason the church crosses all barriers is because believers follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit rather than gravitate to their comfort zones. That's why we see it in this passage. It, Philip didn't already have friends who were Ethiopian eunuchs. But as a result of following a prompting of the Spirit, he winds up making a connection that would not have been made otherwise. Now, this raises an issue. And uh, um, I, this might frustrate a couple of people in the room today. And that's okay. Um, hopefully, you'll still feel like it's good news. There are people who think that organized efforts of organized religion to try to raise funds and, and, and strategically uh, put in place mission work is, is, um, is unnecessary. That if everyone just followed the leading of the Spirit, that we wouldn't need any of that. And lots of people will refer back to the original days of the church when there weren't temples that they worshipped in or buildings. That in, in the early church, there were no buildings like this to worship in. They, they met in homes. And there are, there are people who say, you see, that's what's wrong with the church now is we've, we've gotten away from that to that. No, what I would say is we didn't have to get away from homes. But what I would say is, is that there are some things that we can only accomplish together, and that requires other spiritual gifts too, spiritual gifts of administration, spiritual gifts of strategic planning, spiritual gifts of leadership and development. Like those things are important too. So often people get, they, 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 they gravitate to one extreme or the other. You know, it's all the spirit and, and, and we can't have any organized effort and it it's all has to be organized because you can't trust what, what pops into someone's mind. And what I will tell you is we need both. Does that make sense? We just need both. They're good and they're necessary. 
but nothing can replace our capacity to hear the internal prompting of God's Spirit. We might not be listening, and we might even dismiss what God might be saying to us, but God is not silent. He's speaking today, and he wants to speak to you. When you think about the goal of reaching the world, the simple truth is that it can feel quite overwhelming, and it can produce a fair amount of anxiety in us. How can I be responsible to make sure that my friends, my family, my neighbors, my coworker, my community, and my world all hear the good news? And what I can tell you is we're, we're not responsible for this alone. We're responsible for this together. And God sets up some opportunities, and then he whispers promptings. And so he's not controlling what you're going to do in that moment, but he sets up this interaction that's possible. Philip could have just kept on jogging. He just could have waved. Uh, I don't know this guy. I don't think he'd understand me. And just let him go. But there was this prompting. I'm, I'm wondering, have you had that? in your life. If you had the moment when you felt a whisper to your soul that maybe you need to connect. See, God initiates. He doesn't impose. God goes first every time. When we think about the sovereignty of God, it's really good to start there, that God is the one who takes the initiative. He initiates and he invites. He doesn't impose. He's not going to force you into some relationship with him against your will, or anybody else for that matter. He came to us. We didn't work our way to him. And he will not use his will to override your will. He whispers, he prompts, he invites. And you get to decide what you're going to do with that. Without the Holy Spirit, we will not know what we should know, and we will not go where we should go tend to gravitate to our own comfort zones. I actually think people are interested in spiritual things today. I think materialism has left our homes full and our souls empty. And I think we're getting very thinned out. And we can tell there has to be something more to life than this. So I think we need a broad exposure to Scripture I think just, just doing one of these things and then taking that passage out of context, you can make Scripture say almost anything when you approach Scripture that way. We need a broad understanding. It's, it's why when you come to a, a, a teaching opportunity like this, we actually take time to go through Scripture, and we go through Old Testament and New Testament, and there's all different kinds of topics and focuses and concepts and, and cultural contexts that we want to deal with. We need a broad exposure to Scripture, and we need it to be guided by the Holy Spirit in interpretation of Scripture because this book is spiritually inspired, so it has to be spiritually discerned. It, there's nothing wrong with approaching Scripture as though it's great literature, because it is, but what you'll find is that's, that's inadequate to unearth all of the value that it brings. And then what you can learn to do is to, like Jesus spent time talking with his disciples, showing them where Scripture spoke of him. And here's the most amazing thing, is that when you learn to see Jesus in Scripture, you will see what Jesus sees. You will see other people the way Jesus sees them. You will see our world the way Jesus sees them. There is not a shortage of people who have very big Bibles and very loud voices, and the way they talk would indicate they do not see what Jesus sees. And we need to be people who are saturated in the Word and sensitive to the Spirit so that we can see the world the way Jesus sees it. Now, there's no one God doesn't love in our world, and that'll probably challenge your thinking. And there's no one that God doesn't want to rescue in our world, and that will challenge our approaches. Lots of people feel like they have no family. 
there's not been a medical or a surgical, and I'll ask the worship team to come out now, but there's not been a medical or surgical thing that makes it impossible for them to have a family. They just don't feel like they have a family, even if they have one. There's, there's no bond of love. There's no trust. There's no hope things will get better. And that's why the church can be a family, because the church is a family. That's why God insists of being seen as our father and Jesus as our brother. That's the good news to our world today. So what are we to do with information like this? Well, I'd like us to actually follow up on this. So if you look underneath your seat, every seat should have one of these. There's a, a tiny little card. I'd like you to take it out, pull it out, and grab something to write with. And here's what I want you to do. We're going to take a moment. We're going to bow our heads. We're going to close our eyes. And we're just going to ask God to bring to our mind anyone that he would want us to at least pray for this week and maybe something more than that. So right now, just, just bow your head, close your eyes, and ask God, is there anyone you would like me to pray for or connect with this week? And just, and just wait and see who comes to your mind. You don't have to make something up. I'm not asking you to do that. Just see if there's someone that comes to your mind. And if someone comes to your mind, I want you to jot their name down. Just do that real quick. I'll give you a half a minute to do that. Now, this is what I'd like you to commit to doing. Whoever's name is on that card, I'd like you to take at least a couple minutes every day this week and talk to God about them or for them. Like start a conversation with God. Say, well, I, I know this person really well. Great. God will have you interact with people you know really well, not just strangers. Or maybe it's someone you hardly know at all. You don't know what God is at work doing. And if we're not open to those promptings of his spirit, then, then people like the Ethiopian eunuch just wind up going home as empty as when they came and as heartbroken as before, and nothing in their life changes. And that's not God's intention. So just jot their name down. And Heavenly Father, our commitment to you today is this week, every day, we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to pray. And if you whisper an action step to our hearts as best we can, we will take that. In Jesus' name, amen.